Welcome back into the Red Zone Podcast. My name is Colton Bartholomew, UW football beat reporter here for the Wisconsin State Journal. I am joined by columnist Jim Paul Zine, and he is coming off what we are affectionately calling an OTSI, which is uh, covering a Badger game at night and then getting a crazy early flight the next morning to go to a Packer game. Uh, probably the first of many, well, hopefully not night game for Packers but, or for the Badgers, but first of many OTs for Jim. How are you doing? A couple days removed from that. I'm good. I think I caught up on sleep. I've had two pretty solid sleep nights in a row. Um, so I, I feel refreshed and ready for, um, you know, this week's a bye week for the Badgers and the Packers don't play till Monday night. So it's a little bit different, but next week, I was already thinking about heading to next week and it's going to be interesting because the Ryder cup um, right. is happening. So it's going to be a lot of driving next week. Yeah. Well, we might have to throw some Ryder cup and our big yeah. Notre Dame podcast next week and, I, I, I encourage everybody to go on Madison.com and read the open gym mailbag this week because uh, a couple of guys asked you about uh, the Ryder Cup. And one thing that I want to mention off of what you wrote, saying that uh, the fact that Brooks Kepka and um, Bryson DeChambeau hate each other is an issue. I think there's six other guys in the U.S. team that hate Bryson DeChambeau. They just haven't made it public as, as Brooks yeah, it might be that might, that might be a low number, too. Um, <laughs> right. I'm, not sure. so, I'm actually not sure how much Kepka is liked either. Oh, Is yeah, that a really – I read a really inter- interesting interview with him um, and it basically explained exactly why the U S is bad in these events. It's because like, like Kepka's like, it, he doesn't really care. I mean, he's, it's an individual sport yes. and he talked about how his whole um, process is interrupted this week or, or next week by meetings and, and team building exercises. <laughs> he was no part of that. And I'm just like, wow, that. It really explains a lot because I'm I sure heard that the interview too. And I was like, yeah, that makes sense. That's why you were a golfer. Like you look at his body, you would think he'd be like a tight end or something. It's like, no, that's the, that mental wiring is why you do an individual sport. Kind of makes sense there. But um, as Jim mentioned, we got a bye week for the Badgers. So we still got some things to talk about. We want to talk about some things we've seen on both sides of the ball. We're going to save most of the, the Notre Dame talk for next week. It'll be a big podcast talking about that. And obviously the, the matchup with Jack Cohn and, all the, the storylines that come out of that. But we'll talk about some things on both sides of the ball here for the Badgers and then also make some Big Ten picks. Jim stayed hot last week, and I got red hot. So we're going to see if we can continue it into uh, week three here of the Big Ten season. So we're well, getting all back. Of Yeah, we're back. So I'm feeling good. All right, we'll get into all that right after this. All right, we are back. We're going to quickly – we're going to start off by talking about the Badgers offense because uh, seeing our, our – Twitter mentions and Jim's open mailbag column or open Jim column. And, uh, you know, just the general consensus around Badgerland is uh, people aren't happy with the offense still after a 34, seven win over Eastern Michigan, which should have been 34, nothing. Um, that seven was scored on uh, the backup offense. Chase Wolf throwing a pick six. Um, and I wrote about it this week, Jim, and I saw quite a few people kind of agreeing with me and kind of, um, you know, appreciating that it was pointed out. The lack of motion that the Badgers offense is using um, right now, I mean, in the plays that I've tracked, there's been 11 snaps out of 172 that have used motion, and that's 6.4%. And we were talking about a Badger team that, under Paul Chris especially, has always used motion, right? Always moved around tight ends, moved around fullbacks, moved wide receivers when they wanted to, used the jet sweep, play, basically play action stuff with their wide receivers. It's just been really weird how static the offense has been pre-snap. Yeah, it was noticeable the first week, and then you know, so you kind of pay more attention to it in week two, and you know, again, it, it's same thing. And we're talking about before we got on that you probably it's one thing if you don't do it against Eastern Michigan, but I, it's still kind of a head scratcher why they didn't show more motion, more shifting against Penn State. It's been it's just been such a staple of this offense um, under Paul Christ and. You know, we're how fair we're trying to come up with potential reasons why, and it's just it's it's confusing. I know you asked you asked Paul Christ about it last last week. Um, why don't you tell our listeners what he said? Yeah, so well, I asked him. Didn't say. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Basically, didn't say. But I asked him. You know, if the lack of motion against Penn State was because of something that Penn State was doing, because uh, especially in the first half, Penn State was moving their defensive line. Once Wisconsin got to the line, 
and we're starting to make their cadence calls. So I thought maybe adding motion to that gave the, the offensive line a little too or not enough time to readjust to what Penn State was doing. So you start taking some of that out. Because once you start motion, you're kind of starting the, the play, right? Especially if that's that jet sweep, there's a bunch of timing there. But he said that it wasn't that, or he said it wasn't anything Penn State was doing. It was more just how the game was flowing. And then it wasn't a, a change to the offense. Because that was my kind of follow-up to the question. It was like, was it something that Penn State was doing? Or was it a change that you're trying to make with the offense? And he said it was something, it was more about the game itself and not something to the offense. And then like you mentioned, you go into Eastern Michigan, there was one play out of 70 some uh, that had, that used motion. So it's just strange. And maybe you just, I, I went, I watched that Eastern Michigan game about three times, Jim. I think they ran six plays. I'm not exaggerating. I think they ran the same six plays, either left or right. Maybe that number goes up a little bit with different pass concepts. But I'm, I'm serious when I say I think they ran six plays, and that's all they needed because they were they knew they were better than Eastern Michigan and they wanted to get their line going. But just it's just so strange because the motion, as we said, has been a staple. But then it's been effective when they've done it. The linebackers or the safeties have to adjust to those guys moving around. And then they've had two sweeps to Kendrick Pryor and another one to Chimery DK. One from Pryor and one from DK both went for first downs. And the other one to prior was a nine yard gain on first down. So it's like they, they work and they know they work. It's just weird why they're keeping it in the, in the holster right now. I will say that the one to prior goes down as counting as working, but he, it really got blown up and he made a great, he made a great move to get something out of that. Sure. Um, I mean, but to, but to the point of that's why you do it, right. That's why you get the ball in his hand in space. So yeah, I, I agree there. Like the blocking wasn't quite great, but, because you got the ball in space to one of your better playmakers, he made something happen. Yeah, that's fair. I wasn't saying you shouldn't do it. I just, and you're right. I mean, I personally think Pryor is a guy that probably needs to touch the ball more if possible, some way, um, whether it's passing or in the run game. Um, so it's, it's weird. Like, it, and I asked you beforehand, I'm like, you know, we got to see eight practices in training camp. And I'm like, I was trying to think back. Did, did, did we notice any, um, it, were they not doing, motion or shifting then and neither one of us it, we thought it was normal like that you know I, I don't remember things being abnormal them so I don't know maybe it was a game plan thing in week one and maybe they just decided they didn't need it in week two and we're going to see a, a heck of a lot more of it um, against Notre Dame uh, it's it's just it's just like I said before it's weird because we've seen so much of it over the years uh, so it, for it to almost completely go away is bizarre yeah, and the only other possible explanation, which I really I don't even think this is a real reason, but Jack Eschenbach, number two tight end behind Jake Ferguson, he got hurt early on in the, the Eastern Michigan game. And from from my understanding, we'll see what the official injury report is. But if it was like a bigger game, I, I from what I gathered, he might have been able to come back in. And I think that was a consistent theme through a lot of the injuries that we saw um, last week. But maybe you don't want to – add more to Clay Cundiff's plate coming in as the next uh, tight end, having to do more motion. But I don't know, even then he's been doing it all camp, right? He should be able to. So yeah, I, it's, you know, just, it's not it's like he's a freshman. Strange. Yeah. I mean, Cundiff's been around long enough. Rucci, those guys have been around long enough that um, <clears throat> it shouldn't be, it shouldn't be an issue in terms of you know, learning new things. So I don't know. It's, it's, again, I'll use the word strange because that's what it is. It's just, it's, it's weird that they've strayed from that. Yeah, and it's it adds to it that the rest of the football world, especially in, in the NFL, is going crazy about pre-snap motion. Like, if you're not doing pre-snap motion, you're kind of setting yourself back. I mean, we saw what when Matt LaFleur came to the Packers, that was a big thing that him and Rodgers butted heads about, right? Like, Rodgers didn't like it. He'd rather, you know, just be able to survey, but he came around to it, and there's all that. So it's just weird that the Badgers are doing this. And maybe, maybe we'll look foolish in a week and a half when they, they play Notre Dame and they're you know, moving guys every snap, but um, we'll have to see. It's just a weird development to start this year offensively. Um, and then the other one, and, you know, there's always – anytime it's a quarterback, there's going to be a lot of conversation, especially with Graham Mertz. There's always – there's been a lot of conversation about, you know, his development or, you know, the lack of stuff that we've seen that's different from last year. And the one thing that I've, I've seen a lot of fans talk about, so I try to really dig into, is – how much Graham Mertz is getting from 
know, his first read to a second to a third and going through those progressions. And that's something that takes a while to, to learn at game speed um, when you're a quarterback. And I'm not a quarterback coach. I'm not, I don't have the advantage of all 22 film to know if he's being able to see multiple receivers or checking different things. You know, when he's not like if his head toward one side of the field, there might be multiple receivers at different levels. So he's looking through things I just can't tell from my angles. But it does not appear that there's a ton of getting from the first, second, to third. And then when there is, then the rest of the mechanical process of a quarterback from your you know, feet setting, your shoulders, all that type of stuff, it seems to go out the window the longer he sits back and the more he has to read. And that's something that you would have hoped in a year plus of knowing you're going to be the starter had it been ironed out a little bit more. Yeah. And, you know, I keep going back to the fact that he's only nine games into his career as a starter. And, and that was Saturday, last Saturday was the first non-conference game. Well, I mean, Wick Forest, I guess, but the first Patsy, you know, where you can kind of mm -hmm. get some confidence and work on some things. So I try to keep that in mind, but yeah, I, I do think we're to the point now where some of that stuff should be gone. And, and those habits, those bad habits should be gone. Um, I mentioned in open gym, you know, a buddy of mine texted me Sunday morning. I was on my way to Jacksonville and he was at the game and he played, he actually played football in college. He played defensive back. And he's like, um, cause a lot of people are complaining that they didn't call enough balls downfield. And he's like, if you watch late in the first half, um, they called, they had three, they, they ran out of their 11 package and they ran three fly routes and Merch just locked in on, Jack Dunn, and then kind of threw inside. Dunn didn't look like he knew it was coming. Dunn kept, you know. He that was a bad, bad off. throw. Yep. Right. Unless, you know, yes, that's how it looks. But you never know, was Jack Dunn, should Jack Dunn have read something and cut his route inside? Sure. And that's the one sure. thing we never know. And we run into that problem a lot with, you know, break coverage breakdowns on defense and stuff like that is, you know, it. Whose fault was it really? I mean, it really looks yeah, you, like when you don't know fault. the call, right? That should have been a pick. I mean, the guy dropped it. Um, and then all of a sudden you look at Mertz's, and I, and I don't know, I, I remember that play a little bit, but when I was writing about the game afterwards, um, it wasn't one that stood out. So I'm glad my buddy kind of texted me about it. But um, yeah, it's just stuff like that. You really got to eliminate. And, it, and that's against the even better opponents. Um, that stuff's really going to show up and it, and it might it might end up in a loss. So. There's, there's a lot of stuff from the first two games that are just, you know, clearly stuff he needs to work on. Yeah, and I, I do wonder how we would feel about his performance at, against Eastern Michigan specifically had that pass that he, he dumped off to Clay Cundiff and he ran for a touchdown that got called back would have been completed. Or, you know, Kendrick Pryor had a touchdown in the back of the end zone, took his eyes off it a little too early because he was trying to get his feet down, you know, Tough, uh, somewhat of a tough catch because you're you're dancing on the back of the side or the back end line, but something that you would expect a senior to make. So if you would have had one or two, and those are on the same drive actually, it's different ends of the field because it flipped at a quarter break. But I don't know, would we have felt better if you had a big play touchdown like that on top of what ended up being a pretty solid day? I'm not sure, but the things that we're talking about, some of these, you know, sticking on your first read maybe too long, or your mechanics not being sound when you got to move around, or you've got to get through the play that's stuff that stats owner aren't always going to show and it's like other defenses are going to be able to feast on that if it doesn't start you know kind of figuring itself out here right I mean that's a good point like there's probably five plays right now that um if you switch around if you change a, a, one little thing all of a sudden we have a completely different perception of, of Mertz the DK throw in the in week one which yes. by the way going back to that one I mean it's easy to blame him for that one. Um, the defensive end was kind of in his face. I, I do think he made him adjust. He made Mertz adjust his throw a little bit, which is why I think it sailed. Um, but it's, it's little stuff like that, right? He completes that pass. They win that game. All of a sudden, the perception of how the, the season changes and Mertz looks a little bit better. And, and like, you know, like you said, if one of those two um, touchdown passes counts, or, you know, if they complete those passes, then it's a little bit different. And I understand, I answered a question like this too. I understand why they kept things vanilla in that game because they didn't have mm -hmm. the they needed. Um, but like, I think we all feel a little bit better about Mertz and this offense if they 
would have completed a deep ball or gotten something going in the past game a little bit more. So I don't know. I don't sense that Paul Chris needs that to happen. I don't sense that Mertz's confidence is, is shattered. Um, he's going against a really good defense every day in camp and practice better than the one he saw last Saturday. So I don't know that doing it in game conditions against Eastern Michigan would have made all that much of a difference. But I think for us um, from the outside, there's probably you'd like to see it. Oh yeah, for sure. And when we get to next week, it's just one of those unfortunate parts of the, the matchup and the fact that, that Cone's involved is it's going to be head to head Cone versus him. And, you know, Notre Dame, the way that they've, they've been running their offense, you might have Cone might have twice as many pass attempts. And I know people are going to be like Cone had X yards and Mertz had X or had Y. And it's like, well, yeah, but what does that matter? Like, it's really kind of, it's just one of those things where you're going to, we're going to be comparing the quarterbacks when neither one had any influence on how the other one did. It's just going to be a, just a reality of that game. Yeah. It's, you use the word unfortunate. That kind of, that's kind of how I feel too, is that, you know, Graham Mertz didn't really ask for this, you know, and Jack Cohen certainly didn't ask for this. And, but yet next week's going to be a lot about them and for two guys that aren't even going to be on the field at the same time. Exactly. Yeah. And can't, like I said, and just can't influence. It was always like uh, when the Manning brothers would play each other and uh, I'm, I'm, they always make those big primetime games and they'd ask like, what's it like? I don't know. I'm not watching him when he's out there. Cause I'm doing my thing on the sideline. Like, well, what do you mean? What's it like? But uh, I want to transition over to the defense here because I don't think anybody's surprised how well the Wisconsin defense is playing. Um, but this is, like what they've done, especially against the run, I, I guess I'm going to start there, actually. What they've done against the run, especially against Penn State, is pretty outstanding. I mean, Eastern Michigan didn't try to run, which is fair. Like, they, they knew they didn't have the horses up front. But the thing that's been really impressive to me is the penetration that that front unit's getting, especially because they aren't playing their base packages nearly as much as, you know, you would – you know, by calling it base, it's almost seems like it's out there a lot. It hasn't been. It's almost been exclusively nickel. And the fact that they've been able to get as much penetration and stopping the run as much as they have, it's been really impressive what Matt Henningsen, Keanu Benton, and some of these other linemen are doing. Yeah, with help from the guys behind them too, right? Like, I really do like that front seven. Um, I, I think it's solid and, and haven't even seen Leo Chanel yet, right? I mean, right. Um, you wrote week and he's filled in nicely but um i think we all know that chanel's got potential to be um you know like a all big 10 type and and to not have him these first two weeks uh and yet to show like that in the run game i think has been very impressive yeah and the thing that i think was the best aspect for the defense against eastern michigan i mean outside of pitching the shutout on their end that that's always great that's your your goal but the fact that they got a lot of rotation in throughout the game. And that seemed to be a theme on both sides. Like once they got a comfortable enough lead, getting a bunch of bodies in there and especially up front. I mean, we saw Isaiah Mullins have a pretty solid game against Penn state and then another one against Eastern Michigan. Um, Isaac Townsend, the transfer they got from Oregon, got his first action against Eastern Michigan. Um, uh, Gio Paz, who had a really good um, spring camp playing both nose and tackle uh, had a really good uh, showing against Eastern Michigan. So, this is one of those situations where they were able to almost establish some depth in like mid game, right? Like just able to rotate those guys in, get them more acclimated to game speed, even though it's, you know, against Eastern Michigan, get them ready so that, cause I think this Notre Dame game is going to be a really big test for that defensive line to continue what they're doing because it's, it's cliche and it's the most basic football defense ever, right? Make them one dimensional, but we've seen in the past two weeks for, for this Notre Dame offense, when you take the run away from them and it's all pass, it's a lot easier to go or a lot easier to defend. And it puts all the pressure on cone or whatever quarterbacks in there. We'll get into that next week, but it might be a two, two, two quarterback system again uh, for a Badger opponent. Yeah. I mean, that's what these games are for, right? You want to get as many guys in there as possible and, and get some reps. And we, I think we hit on this a little bit last week. I know I did in one of my questions, I mean, in a perfect world, you'd like to play Eastern Michigan in week one and lead into the Penn State game, right? Um, and then just to get a game under your belt and 
and have that. I mean, personally, I like having attractive week one games. Um, it's just, I think it, it's, it's a great way to kick off the season. But I think if you're a coach, you probably would have liked to ease your way in a little bit and mm -hmm. you know, get some of those guys reps. But I, I, I do think there's a lot of body. We saw that in camp a little bit. Like they were, I mean, when they went from ones to twos, there wasn't a huge drop off. And I, so I do think they have some pretty quality depth there, um, especially, and we talked about this too, like in the secondary, they have a ton of corners and, and we knew who one and two were um, figuring out three, anywhere from three to six was always a little bit of a challenge and not because any of them were bad as nobody was separating themselves, which I think is speaks to the depth more than anything. Um, and they needed some of the other day. I mean, no Hicks, um, no Colin Wilder. Uh, so they need some new guys to step in and, you know, there was no drop off. Yeah. It was almost like a night off for the secondary against Eastern Michigan, just with the penetration that the front seven was getting the pass rush was really harassing them. I mean, you expect that against a, an FCS opponent or not FCS, excuse me, uh, a Mac opponent with the, just a discrepancy of the offensive line there. Uh, but it was impressive to me to see a guy like Alex Smith, who has been the third corner, you know, lots of, outside reps when they move Fan Hicks and the nickel uh, come in and just really lock down the side of the field and give them flexibility in the back end. And then the Colin Wilder uh, absence last week, I, I want to mention Hicks and Wilder look like they're going to be able to play next week. From what I gather, they were moving around quite well on the sidelines. Um, we'll have to see what the official status report is on Monday, but it does look like they're going to be available. You know, if not, there might be some, some shuffling that needs to happen, but I did like the amount of reps that it got a guy like Travion Blaylock because he's a guy that we've heard about athletically and just, you know, speed, size, all that type of stuff. We've heard about it for a long time from Jim Leonard. That's the type of guy that is a, is a matchup eliminator, right? Like, especially, and we're going to talk about this a lot next week, but the Notre Dame game, their best player on offense so far this season has been Michael Mayer, Michael Mayer the tight end. And Blaylock's a guy with the size and the speed that, he can be a man-to-man -man tight end eliminator. And if Wilder's in a rotation or, you know, getting Blaylock up to speed game-wise before this Notre Dame game, I think is a huge advantage because I think he's a guy that they're going to need to need on the field against Notre Dame because of the, the athletic matchups that, that Notre Dame presents on the outside, especially with Mayer. So I, I think getting him more involved and getting that safety depth on the field, we've heard about it getting them actual game reps is a big deal. Yeah. Mayor's got 16 catches, 201 yards, three touchdowns already this season in two games. Um, Blaylock, you know, Blaylock's so intriguing. He looks the part, right? Um, he's kind of how you want a safety to look and has just had trouble kind of establishing a role. Um, but he's in his fourth year now. He's, I mean, it's, it's, again, I said this before about other guys, but it's time. Uh, mm -hmm. You want to see those guys step up. And if everything clicks for him, he's a guy that I think could have a really nice, um, finish to his career back there. Jim, I'm going to uh, ad lib on you real quick before we move on to picks, but I know this is something that fans have been talking a ton about um, online and, you know, in the days since the Eastern Michigan game, uh, defensive tackle, Taron Rush um, <laughs> had himself a day against the Badgers, uh, very clearly raking at the eyes of Graham Mertz after a sack, uh, stepping on the chest of, or chest and stomach of Braylon Allen after he scored his touchdown. I, uh, as of we're recording this about one o'clock on Wednesday, I uh, haven't seen any official, you know, suspension or discipline from uh, the Mac or from Eastern Michigan regarding rush. Um, we heard Tyler beach, uh, the offensive tackle for the Badgers talk about after the game that uh, rush was also spitting on players um, in between plays, apparently spit. I mean, the one that Tyler beach named was spit on Chesma Luzzi after a run. Um, I don't know. I'm, I'm very surprised there hasn't been some type of official, at least acknowledgement of what we saw on TV. It's weird that to have something, multiple events like that happen and there'd be no, you know, at least, Hey, we don't allow that or we don't think that's okay. Yeah. I, I mean, I, I guess I'd attribute to this. Um, it's not a power conference team and it's not a team that's covered um by any media that I could see like we our our Jake Adams was kind of handling the visiting locker room for us the other day and he went down to um their coach's press conference and was literally the only guy there yeah 
asked all four questions um, and then try to get a player and that didn't work out. So I think that's part of it is just that, um, you know, there's not a beat writer over there that asks this, asks these questions. I am, they play UMass this week. I'm really intrigued to see if he, if Rush participates. I went actually, you know, I went on a deep dive a little bit yesterday. Um, it's not like this is some um, young guy who doesn't, who doesn't know any better. Uh, he was one of the representatives at uh, Mac Media Day. Right. Um, he's on a leadership council of some sort, some sort of um, like leadership nonprofit. Um, so it's not, you know, it doesn't fit into that type of, um, you know, what, what you've seen from him off the field. And it's, it was just bizarre. And I didn't notice it in real time, you know, I, until I heard you guys talking about it afterwards with those guys with, with Beach bringing it up, I had no idea. But then you see some of the clips and it's just like, wow, like, who does that? Why, why would you do that? Especially now with all... I was just gonna say like one more thing, like you can't do that these days. There's so many cameras on people. Like it's just, you can't get away with it. Yeah, for sure there. And then I was just amazed that most, all those events happened. The refs never threw a flag on him. And the one personal foul there was in the game was Logan Brust for just shoving him after he had stepped on Braille and Allen. And it's like, I, I guarantee Paul Chris, there's no punishment toward Logan Brust on that one. Cause that's just defending your teammate and something you want to see out of a senior lineman. But it, it was just, it's just a strange thing to me to see that type of stuff happen and really not get caught throughout an entire game. It was, it was just a weird situation. And yeah, I'm, I'll be straight. I was honest. I was very much expecting to see, you know, Tuesday or Wednesday, a, a tweet blow up about him getting suspended or being, you know, out of half or something like that for what happened. But I don't know. I guess, like you said, they, they play UMass this week, and we'll see if he's out there. But all right, let's jump into our Big Ten picks. As we've mentioned a couple of times, Badger's on the bye week. Um, so we don't have a Badger game to talk about. We've got quite a few other ones that are intriguing. Last week, Jim went eight and four. I went 10 and two. So close the gap a little bit throughout the season. Jim's at 15 and seven on the season. I am at 13 and nine. And Jim, we will start with a Friday night game. Maryland is going to Illinois. Maryland is a seven and a half point favorite in Champaign. What are your thoughts? I believe I've been pretty good with the fighting Bielema's this year. You are. Got, have I gotten all three right? Yes. Okay. I'm picking Illinois this week. And it's just, again, like, I think Maryland's really good. Um, but the fact that they're going on the road for a Friday night game uh, makes me think this game's going to be a little bit closer. I, I think Maryland could win, but I think it's going to be tight. Um, I certainly don't think they're going to cover, you know, the seven and a half point spread. Yeah, that, that hook scares me a lot. Um, the one thing that I'm going against you, and I don't know why, because like you said, you're three no with Illinois, and I probably should just keep or listen to you on this. But the what Virginia really exposed was how weak Illinois secondary is, and I think that Maryland receivers and and uh, Tungo Bailoa can do that too. So I'm just going to go with that mindset as opposed to the pretty logical reasoning you have there about early week game or earlier in the week game and on the road, but um, I'm going to lay the seven and a half. I don't feel good about it. All right. Nebraska is going to Oklahoma, the game of the century from 50 years ago. Cause we haven't heard that enough this week. Okay. I mean, God help them. I understand they're trying to blow up a, a game because of the history of it, but this is going to be ugly. Oklahoma is a 22 point favorite at home. We are both on Oklahoma. Uh, I just, I, I said a couple weeks ago, I will not pick Nebraska again. And I don't care. That's a big point spread. I'd not just Oklahoma all the way. I was surprised it was actually that low. I mean, when you sent me that, I was, my first thought was, is that a mistake? Because <laughs> I agree with you. I think, I think Oklahoma is going to, um, I think they're going to win by a lot. I don't think they're going to like let up either. Like, I, I just think there's been enough in this series where with a possible dropping out, they wanted to change it. Um, I think Oklahoma is going to make a statement. Yeah, that uh, the former Nebraska AD saying that Scott Frost wanted to get out of that game. That's a uh, that's a rough look, and I think that's a uh, big noon kickoff. I believe is there for Fox, and I'm sure that's going to be mentioned on a sign or two uh, in their pregame show. So uh, next game here we got on Saturday. Cincinnati is going to Indiana. Cincinnati is a four point favorite. Um, I don't know. This one was weird to me. I I am one of the few. I think it might be the only. AP top 25 voter that still has Indiana ranked. 
Um, All that. Yeah, Indiana lost. Like, uh, yeah, they lost big at Iowa, but Iowa is now a top five team, and their defense is really, really good. And then they kicked the crap out of an FCS school. So why is Indiana not ranked, and then not getting any other respect? I, I think being a four point favor or underdog at home. I know how good Cincinnati is. I, I don't understand that line entirely. I'm going to go with Indiana because I'll take a home dog in, a, in this type of game. But I don't know. I maybe I miss rose colored glasses with Indiana because I, I'm, like I said, I'm the only AP voter that has them still ranked. No, I'm there with you. I, I again, my whole reasoning is the home dog thing. Um, by the way, I was doing some research for Open Gym this week and in, in passing efficiency stuff. Um, just to see where Graham Mertz ranked in the league. Do you know who's dead last in the Big Ten in pass efficiency rating? Is it Penix? Because you were bringing yeah, them now. It is. Yeah, that, that's yeah. shocking. I mean, I know that's an obvious thing. It is shocking. <laughs> I mean, like I, I, I had this guy as a you know like a dark horse Heisman guy. Mm. Um, he has not been good to start this season, and a lot of that was in the Iowa game. But uh, it's it's. It's weird. I, I really thought this team would be better, um, but I do think they're going to bounce back this week. I think I think they'll, I think they're going to win that game. That'll be a big upset, but it's very possible. Um, I, I'm I'm still taking. I think Cincinnati wins close, but I'll take the four points. Um, Michigan State is going to Miami. This is a uh, potential huge statement game for the uh, Fighting Nell Tuckers um, in uh, in the Spartans. Six and a half points for as a favorite for Miami. I don't know. I'm really, really tempted to take the six and a half. And my case would only be that Michigan State's offense has playmakers and can control the clock with the run game. And shockingly to me, because I, I did not think they were going to be good on defense, but Michigan State's secondary is pretty solid. Like they're not getting killed down the field, which I thought they were going to all year. So I'm really tempted to talk me out of it. Well, I can't really talk you out of it with too much heart because I, I was really torn on this one. I just, I think Miami's going to win by a touchdown. So I think that's, I, that spread seems about right to me. And sure. it's just a matter of picking one way or the other. And I'm going to go with the home team. That's the only thing. Um, but I, I like Michigan state too. Like it's been, they, they are, they have become a fun team to watch. I just, we talked about this last week and the week before they've got some studs on the outside. They've got a really good running back. Um, he's done a really good job of overhauling that roster in a hurry. And, and I'm impressed. Yeah. I'll still go with Miami. I want to ride with you on that one, but it will not shock me at all. If Michigan state has that very close or wins that game. I just, there's a formula there for Michigan state, as long as they can avoid turnovers and the other, you know, basic stuff to not, you know, get it out of hand. Uh, Northern Illinois is going to Michigan. We'll keep this one short. Michigan is a 27 point favorite. Uh, we have seen Michigan already against an overmatched opponent be very willing to cover the spread and run it up. So that's kind of my mentality. I think they're going to do it again. Same. Ditto. Um, I, I'm, you know, it's, it's funny that was the Notre Dame Wisconsin game, um, is big, but then that Michigan game the week after is looming as a really big game too. So this is a really interesting stretch for the Badgers. For sure. All right, Minnesota is going to Colorado. Colorado is a two and a half point favorite coming off their almost upset of Texas A&M. I'm holding my nose while I do it, Jim, but I think Minnesota can win that game. I, really? I know I do. I, I know Colorado played really well last week. I think there's going to be a hangover of that because they should have won that game. They outplayed Texas A&M. They ended up losing. I think there's a hangover there. Uh, I think Minnesota has enough. They're getting Chris Altman and Bell back, it sounds like. That's a big factor in my mind. But even if they don't, I still feel like they've got enough. Colorado's front's good, but Minnesota's offensive line, it got a lot of hype in 2019. It fell back because of some opt-outs and injuries in 2020. It's pretty much back in 2021. So I like that matchup. I'll take the two and a half points, but I'm, like I said, holding my nose while I do it. Yeah, this is actually the one on the on the list that I felt most confident about. So I'm, I'm surprised to hear you go that way. I, I, I just think Colorado um, will win. I, Minnesota really struggled last week too. And that's probably, I'm basing a lot on that. Um, I just, I don't know that they can go on the road and, and stay within a field goal. That's fair. I think a, a bunch of people keep asking about, uh, or asking PJ Fleck about the elevation. It's like, this is not the first time any, like, yeah, you have to prepare for it, but this isn't like rocket science. I don't know. It just, maybe it's just one of those easy storylines in a week that you got to ask about think of his name coming up with the usc job he has a fantastic agent like that guy should be getting contacted by everybody 
there is not a chance in the world that Minnesota hired or USC hired BJ Fleck. I probably should have brought it up in the Cincinnati game. I'm going to say that's a little bit of my reasoning for the Cincinnati because I don't know if you saw Dennis Dodd from CBS reported that it's uh, Luke Fickle's job. USC is Luke Fickle's job to turn down. And oh. uh, I'm sure that was seen around the uh, Cincinnati campus. So it, we'll it doesn't seem like a great fit to me. Like, I think Luke Fickle's a good coach. Um, I agree. He's, there, already, but... he's already, you know, he's had the Ohio State job briefly. Um, it just, it seems like Cincinnati seems like the perfect spot for him. And certainly the Midwest seems like the, the best spot for him. That I don't know. That USC job is weird. Um, you need the right person to go in there. And I don't know that Luke Fickle's that would be my first choice. And that's the only, I see, that'd be the only case I would make for PJ Fleck is that he would be all for the, the hype train of being in LA and being USC and all that type of stuff. So uh, it's, that's going to be a weird subplot throughout the year. Cause we're going to get to another coach that's, right up there uh, in Penn state. But the fact that there are multiple Midwest slash big 10 guys that are being considered, I don't know. And it, it all kind of goes back to the new AD or somewhat new AD at USC. Uh, allegedly he won somebody that he knows well. And the, all the guys that were talking about it would, would fit in that category, but I don't know. It, it's going to be a, a subplot to watch throughout the entire college football season, because if you get the right person in there, it's going to take maybe two years of getting recruits in and USC's back because that's the, the resources that program has and the athletes that they're pulling from in their area. So, all right, Purdue is going to Notre Dame. Notre Dame is a seven and a half point favorite. Um, Purdue, eh, I don't know. They, they had a nice blowout win last week that they should have against UConn. I don't think they're bad. David Bell's really good. Like he tore up UConn like, like he should. I just think Notre Dame's got enough guys on their defense to be able to, to hold him down. And then if you take him away, I don't think they have much else. They lost their running back for uh, six to eight weeks. So that's a big deal. Or excuse me, four to eight weeks, which I thought was a weird timeline. But uh, uh, that's that's a big loss for their offense. I think Notre Dame somewhat easily covers. Seven and a half was a little low in my mind. That's what I thought too. And and, and losing Horvath, I thought was a big uh, – it's just going to make them so one-dimensional. And, and I think – I also think Notre Dame is going to make a statement or try to make a statement. Um, yeah, after I, that. I don't think Brian Kelly has been happy with their performance the first two weeks. And for sure. I think, he, yeah, I think he's going to try to get them going in the right direction, headed into Wisconsin. Yeah, for sure. All right, Kent State is going to Iowa. Iowa is a 22-and-a-half point favorite. This is one we disagree on. I'm on Iowa because I don't think Kent State scores. This Iowa defense is really, really good. That front seven does not let you move the ball on the ground. You have to beat them in the air. I don't think um, Kent State's going to be able to do that consistently enough. And the biggest thing with that is I don't think they're going to be able to get into tempo like they usually would because they're not going to get enough first downs. Uh, I just think Iowa rolls in that game. Yeah, it was an interesting one. Um, and I looked up – I you know, obviously haven't seen Kent State play this year. Uh, Sean Lewis, former UW guy, is their coach, and he runs that kind of that up-tempo um, – offense out they were really good last year um or two years ago i just think it's a three touchdown game and 22 and a half seemed kind of high for me that's my only reason but i've been really impressed by iowa like kind of wondering how we kind of missed iowa um it, everybody was so on the wisconsin bandwagon in, in the big 10 west when the season started um it seems like this is one of kirk ferentz's sneaky good teams and they've been really good the last what since like week two or three last year yeah, since, yeah, exactly. Two, week two last year on, they've been undefeated, I'm pretty sure. Right. So, yeah. That, I, Maybe I just talked myself into it, but um, I, I I, think Kent State will keep it within three touchdowns. I, I just think after blowing I, – I know the score wasn't a quote-unquote blowout because it was basically two scores, but they, they blew out Iowa State. They, they were in control of that game the entire way. And I just think that – you come off of that in the state of Iowa, and then you play a home game against a lesser opponent. You, you, I think this is a Tyler Goodson might have like 300 yards type of game. Um, if you if you remember that, that Kent State defense against Jonathan Taylor in 2019, right. he let up like 250 yards and a half. So yeah. we'll see. But I'm on Iowa in a big one there. Uh, trivia Tulsa, quick quick yeah. trivia question for you again. Trivia question number two. Um, so Penix is below Mertz in the. Um, Pass efficiency. Who's the only other Big Ten quarterback below Mertz? Is it Petrus? 
Yeah, it is. I was surprised to see that too, which which maybe tells you a little bit about what you need to know about the pass efficiency numbers, right? Because he's been, yeah, because it's only got one touchdown because, pass. Yeah, he's only got one touchdown pass, and I and I, I don't know that his completion percentage is super high, so I think that has a lot to do with it. I think he's played pretty good. I, Iowa only had like one good offensive quarter last week. Um, so I don't, I still don't know how good he is, but it, I did find it interesting that a team that's rolled um, to two wins over ranked opponents to start the season has a quarterback that's ranked 13th in the Big Ten in pass efficiency. Yeah, for sure. All right. Tulsa is going to Ohio State, 24 and a half point favorite for the Buckeyes, coming off that tough loss against Oregon at home. Uh, we are both on Iowa or on Ohio State because. I don't think you're going to see that same uh, off or same defensive performance. I mean, Tulsa doesn't have the weapons Oregon does. Um, and that was a huge gut check game for that front seven for the Buckeyes. And Oregon basically manhandled them on the line. That's a you know testament to Mario Cristobal. But we're not going to see that again from Tulsa. Ohio State's going to roll on that one to kind of get the taste out of their mouth. I was really impressed by Oregon, by the way. That was, I mean, that was an impressive performance from start to finish. Um, but I agree, Ohio State's going to bounce back. and. Um, interesting that there's some calls for the defensive coordinators head out there um, I, after only way two. I I book, I'm going to be shocked if he's the defensive coordinator at the end of the year. I mean, I don't know if you saw the quotes uh, from Ryan Day on Tuesday, I believe, but he basically said that they're changing a ton of things, quote unquote, structurally defensively. Um, and then basically declined to give any type of vote of confidence for the defensive coordinator. So I think that guy's, yeah, that guy's uh, house is on the market and his wife's starting to pack some things up around the house, in my opinion. Um, Not not exactly a ringing endorsement. Yeah, for sure. All right. Northwestern is going to Duke. Uh, Northwestern is a three point favorite on the road. I know Duke's terrible. Northwestern's not that much better. I'm, you and I have I've seen your face. You and I are on the same mind here. I'll take the three points of the home dog, even though Northwestern's more than likely better. I don't care. They're not good. Yeah, I just can't see them going on the road. I, I, again, that was another one that's kind of a head scratcher. I looked up who Dukes all played and stuff. Um, they're not good, but I can't imagine they're this bad. Yeah. And I don't know. Duke could be one of the worst Power Five uh, football programs in the, the country this year, but uh, you're still not getting me to lay points with Northwestern on the road at this point. All right, our last game, a rank versus rank matchup. This might be the game of the week in the Big Ten. Uh, Auburn is going to Penn State. Penn State is a six-point favorite. We are both on Penn State. I think this is kind of when people realize how good Penn State is. I think this is a potentially big win for them, like like 14, 20-point type of win. I I just think their offensive weapons match up really well with some of the deficiencies Auburn's got on the back end. So I'm going to go Penn State all the way there. I agree with you. Um, I, I was thinking this week, uh, probably on the way home from Jacksonville, that, you know, as much as was we made out of that Wisconsin loss and, and everything it did wrong in that game, um, maybe Penn State's just good. Maybe maybe they lost to a top 10 team, a team that could legitimately maybe even win the Big Ten because if Ohio State's not who we thought it might be, um, maybe this is the best team in the Big Ten, and, and, that's, and that's part of the reason why Wisconsin looked the way it looked. Um, you know, they've got, we've already talked about Jahan Dotson, who mm-hmm. could be the best, one of the best receivers in the country. Um, solid, solid enough running game, I think. Sean Clifford, as long as he doesn't, you know, make stupid mistakes throwing interceptions, I think he's a solid quarterback. And I think the defense is way better than we thought it could be. Yeah, I, um, that's the thing that's Johnny, been the right. biggest standout to me is that front seven defensively is much better than I thought it was going to be. And I remember my rationale last week for, for picking against Penn State versus the spread was that, I thought they'd be beat up um, from the Wisconsin game because they had to go 95 plays. And those guys played really well last week. I mean, Ball State's Ball State, granted. But um, 44 to 13, it was an impressive performance. It was, you know, they were in control the entire way. So I, I, I'm i slowly but surely becoming a Penn State believer. Yeah, I'm with you. Do you think that James Franklin's name being out there for the USC job matters for this one? I mean, he, he very quickly shut it down. I mean, that's he's doing what all coaches do in these situations. But I don't know, Dan Patrick, who's you know got a dubious track record with his information regarding Big Ten and other things of that nature. But um, he, he reported today on his show that there's mutual interest between James Franklin and, and USC. Uh, I don't know. I, I don't know how much it matters for this type of game or this week, but 
something to put in the particular file for down the road. Yeah, I know he addressed it with his team and those guys said all the right things um, after availability and stuff. Uh, I mean, that would be, I think, a decent fit out there. Like, I, it would make sense to me in a lot of ways. Um, I, I do hate to some degree that this is the way it is. Like, I don't feel bad for James Franklin here. Um, I, feel I feel bad, bad for, for Clay Hilton. USC had clearly zero faith Clay Hilton was the guy. Why did you keep him for this season? I know it's I know it's an embarrassing loss to Stanford at home, and I get all that, but it's like if one loss in a season where you came in like really not expected to win the Pac-12 or anything it was going to be the, the tipping point, it wasn't. You already made up your mind. You just needed the, the, the last straw like that. I don't know. That's dumb management, in my opinion. Yeah, I agree. The timing's weird. And then, like I said, it, and then it impacts it impacts so many other programs. Like now you've got – here's 10 guys that could possibly be the next USC coach, and it just – it's a trickle-down effect, and it, it impacts other programs. And it's just – I hate that part of it. You know, I, I like, I don't know that it, does it really give them a leg up in the search? Like you could have waited and waited closer to championship week and then got a head start on most teams, but I don't know that this is going to, I don't know if this is going to help anything. Yeah. It's, I've seen the argument that it's for recruiting and you're trying to, to keep the, the kids that are already committed, but it's like the kids that committed, committed to that coach. So they're already going to, be looking out for other things. I don't know. It's just, I, I like I said, I think it's bad management on USC's part. They clearly have never liked Helton or thought Helton was the guy for the past three years and then never either found somebody they thought was better or just, you know, had the stones to pull the trigger and do it. And then now they do it now and mess a bunch of things up. So either way, it's going to be something that's hovering over a lot of programs throughout the year. And it's just going to be a, another strange wrinkle to what's our, I think this college football season we've already seen is going to be awesome because there's, there's obviously the, the pinnacle, right? There's, it's kind of Bama and everybody else. People keep saying Bama and Georgia. It's not like, I understand how good Georgia's defense is, but put them on the field with Bama's receivers and quarterback. It's that, I don't think that's close. Basically Bama and everybody else, but that everybody else category is going to be really fun to watch. Yeah, I agree. I mean, there's probably, seven or eight teams and I'd throw Notre Dame in that mix um, of teams that can make the playoff and at least get in. Right. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I agree with you after watching Bama, I think they are clearly head and shoulders above the rest. Yeah. All right. As usual, Jim, we said we were going to keep it short and we went about normal time or almost to an hour. Uh, so we'll get to wrapping up here. Make sure you guys are on madison.com and make sure you're subscribed there. $1 for six months. Uh, the deal is still going on. Uh, make sure you signed up. You get through, Football season, a bowl season, some recruiting stuff. I mean, lots of great stuff is going to be happening Badger wise in the next six months. Basketball, hockey will be starting up. Uh, so make sure you're signed up there. Um, make sure you go check out Open Gym, uh, Jim's mailbag column. You, you can tweet him to submit questions. You can email him. Uh, lots of good stuff, lots of thought provoking stuff. Jason Wildy made an appearance. Um, I thought I want a bone to pick, uh, bone to pick with you here, Jim. Jason gets to write his answers. I just get to text you or, or talk to you. Well, that's so. Here's the thing. <laughs> like I, I'm, and I, like I hope I make it clear to our readers that I'm constantly relying on you for information on some of the. You don't yeah, know I know. I'm just messing with you. I, I name drop you, but I texted Jason this morning because I like I put together an answer last night, and I'm like, uh, you know, I really need to check with him. So I, I gave him the whole question, and he comes back and he's like, "Here's what I would say," and then he puts quote marks and then gives me this long spiel. I'm like, <laughs> I'm like, I can't plagiarize that right I'm like, just, like, i'll give so so there's there's your in right there if um if in the future i text you a question statement from the desk of colton bartholomew will be the exactly. next response yes. to these. <laughs> exactly so yeah it was I, I felt a little bit weird about it but i'm like you know the alternative was just flat out plagiarizing him i'm not going to do that either so oh that's fair all right so make sure you check out open gym and submit some questions there jim is doing a really good job uh, answering pretty much every question that he gets that's within reason i guess <laughs> yeah i've only skipped a couple of them and um it's it's in, in fairness there's been some really good questions i think uh the readers are doing a good job of not just giving um a, a word we used a lot lately is vanilla they're not giving me vanilla <laughs> questions um some some people are putting a lot of thought into them and i appreciate it for sure all right so make sure i'm asking.com like i said before one dollar for six months of all access digital coverage there and uh, we're going to be somewhat quiet this weekend with Badger stuff, but then hitting it full force 
uh, next week. It's going to be quite the week with the Badgers uh, Notre Dame game, assuming Notre Dame wins uh, against Purdue. If they don't, we're possibly talking about a loser leaves town for any type of postseason hopes and it adds maybe some more intrigue. So we'll see there, but uh, we will be back next week in the podcast. Thank you guys very much for listening.